Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, still sheltering in place here in Bethesda, Maryland. And I thought it'd be nice if I posted another Gross Path Challenge. This one is gonna be Gross Path Challenge number 66. You notice I probably don't post them every day. But if you're watching the Foundation's Facebook page on a regular basis, you'll know that we have a lot of other things going on. On Wednesdays, I post the results of that day's Wednesday slide conference. On Fridays, we have our free Friday seminar. And starting on May 12th, on Tuesdays, we'll have all day seminars, one on May 12th being equine diseases. But on the other days, I hope to post the Ghost Path Challenge every day. So I want you to come to the Foundation's Place Facebook page every day for something new. With all of that said, let's go on to slide number one. And slide number one is tissue from a dog. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and two possible causes? Okay, time's up. This one's a little bit difficult to get oriented on. We are looking at the lungs. Here's some large airways, possibly the carinus here. Here is the esophagus, and we're looking at the pulmonary artery. And you can see that the pulmonary artery is very corrugated in this particular animal. This is a very characteristic lesion for heartworm disease. In the North American continent, it would be diaphragmatic imidus. You can also see this uh, as a change uh, in Europe with European heartworm, Angiostrongylus vasorum. This one is about as bad as it gets. It's very corrugated. And if you look closely at this under the microscope, you can see that the uh, intima of the pulmonary yeah. artery is thrown into these papillary fronds in a condition known as uh, arterial endarteritis or villar endarteritis. So I think that a really good morphologic diagnosis for this would be diffuse severe pulmonary arterial villar endarteritis. And then you want to know about diaphragmatic imidus, you want to know about angiostrongylus vasorum. Um, another thing that you probably should be familiar with is there is a bacterial agent, an endosymbiont, lives inside of a number of filarial parasites, including these two known as Wolbachia pipiensis. It was first discovered back in the 90s. There's been a, a lot of work done on this uh, within the last couple of years, and a couple of really nice papers published in, in up to 2019. It's an endosymbiont, and it's required for normal maturation and persistence of these filarial infections. It's not just heartworms, it's seen in Anca circa uh, and several other filarial parasites. And there's a school of thought now that if an animal cannot take the arsenical drugs, which are used to uh, kill off the heartworms, that targeting this bacterial endosymbiont with something like doxycycline might also uh, be a potential treatment. This particular treatment decreases the number of T regulatory cells within the, uh, uh, within the local area, making the animal more uh, favorably predisposed to traditional heartworm treatment. So know about that bacteria, Wolbachia uh, pipiensis, and its uh, requirement for these flourishing uh, filarid infections in other species. Okay, slide number two is tissue from two pigs. Uh, can you give me a morphologic diagnosis? And I would like five possible causes. Five. Okay, time's up. We have multiple nasal dermal vesicles. And you can say that however you want. Uh, you could say a uh, vesicular nasal dermatitis. What I want you to see are these vesicles. They are generally going to pop pretty quickly, you end up with an ulcer. These particular pigs may have other ulcers. They may have them in their mouth, which will make them smack and drool. Uh, they often will have them in the coronary band, in between the toes where there's any type of friction. Blisters and blistering diseases tend to be worse where there are friction. 
um, where stuff rubs together and it, it loosens the epithelium um, and, and makes these worse. Um, so I asked for five possible causes. Now don't confuse causes with the disease. I'm gonna give you both of them, but when I ask for cause, that's generally the name of the virus that affects you. So there's five. Now there used to be four, classically four. Remember that pigs are susceptible to all of the vesicular diseases. Um, these tend to be uh, you know, spread out and not every species when we talk about uh, ruminants and we talk about uh, horses, we talk about pigs, are susceptible to all of them, but pigs, get them all. So you need to know all of them. And the most important one is going to be porcine aphthovirus, um, which, and that's the name, way I named these agents. I just put species in front and I, and I put the virus second. Is it specific to porcine? No. Uh, you could uh, bo have bovine aphthovirus, which causes foot and mouth disease, or equine aphthovirus, but that's as a general rule for a certification examination, you should always have a species in front of the virus. Because remember, there are many herpes viruses and, and the herpes viruses uh, that cause disease in one species might not cause diseases in another. So, um, but let's get back to these sickle diseases. Now, why are these important? They're important because of foot and mouth disease. The rest of them we hardly ever see, a lot of them are historical. We don't worry about them so much. If you do have an outbreak, it's a localized outbreak, but foot and mouth disease, that's something very different. And so we report, these are all reportable, so we can prove they're not foot and mouth disease. One is porcine aptovirus. Um, there are differences in the way that, uh, that ruminants and pigs are affected. Pigs are amplifier hosts. What they do is they create tremendous amounts of virus. And the problem with these aptoviruses is they're transmissible on aerosols. They're extremely contagious. They're easily taken from one area to another. In horses and, and, and ruminants and pigs, they don't cause much of a disease. They cause blisters. The animals will go off food. Most, they're not killing anybody. Um, in ruminants, obviously, and pigs, you are going to lose production in terms of, of meat for your dollar of food. Um, and then they're so incredibly contagious. The reason that the animals are slaughtered is because of the contagiousness and the need to contain this. But in terms of killing animals, they won't. In pigs, very young animals, uh, very young pigs, very young calves, you may see that uh, um, there is necrosis of the heart. This virus causes what's known as tiger stripe in the heart. So you can have some mortality in very young animals, but adult animals, it's mostly a vesicular disease. Uh, so pigs, they transfer, or they, they create tremendous amounts of these viruses, which um, has been known in outbreaks in the UK get on the wind and, and infect neighboring farms. Uh, when you get to something like small ruminants, small ruminants show very minimal signs, maybe a tiny blister on the coronary band. And for some reason, people like to throw uh, goats in the back of their truck and drive them around. I got no idea why. Um, but this will transfer the virus as well. So just remember, we report all these diseases, make sure we know what they are because if it's an outbreak of foot and mouth disease, it could be absolutely devastating to the agricultural industry in any country, especially the United States. Okay, we'll quickly go through the others. Vesicular stomatitis is a rhabdovirus. It'll be porcine rhabdovirus is the agent, the condition, vesicular stomatitis. The lesion's gonna be exactly the same. You can see this in horses, we have periodic outbreaks of horses in the West, sometimes in South Georgia, um, but doesn't cause a lot of problems. We test it because we're afraid of mouth disease. There are a couple of picornaviruses that will cause this type of disease in pigs. Swine vesicular disease oh, was, was named by somebody who didn't have a whole lot of uh, creativity, just, just called it what he saw. Um, and that is an enterovirus of the picornaviridae causes this lesion. And there is another picornavirus, um, which is a new one. It's the newest on the market. It's the only species in its own family, and that's a Seneca virus. And this popped up probably about five or six years ago. Of course, everybody got excited about it, and then it, it would turn out it was a fairly novel uh, picornavirus. So Seneca virus will do this. And then the other classic one, which is an interesting one because it's spilled over into marine mammals, is uh, vesicular exanthema of pigs. This is a Khaleesi virus, and this Khaleesi virus 
um, has spilled over into marine mammals on the west coast of the U.S. It hasn't been seen in a number of years. You probably can still see, but it causes vesicles on the flippers and in the mouth of uh, California sea lions. And it's been able to get into some of the food fish, the California sea lions, like, like the opali fish, and sort of uh, hangs around in there. The opali fish often get caught in tidal pools when the tide goes out. And the sea lions say, ah, here's a fish. I don't have to swim for it. Just grab it. But if that animal's carrying this particular Khaleesi virus, then that's not good. Once again, generally doesn't kill these animals, but can uh, make them miserable for a while. So those are all your vesicular diseases in a flash. Boy, hope the next slide is not going to be one that requires such a long description. Okay, here's a goodie. Uh, this is tissue from an ox. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause? Okay, time's up. I'm not gonna waste a lot of time because this is a made up lesion. This used to be a classic lesion for rinderpest. And what we're looking at are uh, linear areas of congestion and some ulceration in the colon. And this used to be called tiger striping, and it was thought to be a classic lesion of rinderpest, because people would see that. Um, rinderpest is a uh, virus that is now extinct. It was in the morbilli virus family, and it caused a pneumogastroenteritis. I like that, pneumogastroenteritis, which simply means that it affects both the respiratory tract and the GI tract, just like um, a disease which is very similar to it, Pastite du petit ruminants in small ruminants does. Well, this was uh, one of the viruses that uh, a major uh, attack was made on all over the world, and we have eradicated this virus. But this lesion is still around, and it's in places where you never see render pest. Okay, you can see this in an animal with a uh, case of Yoni's disease. And what this tiger striping lesion is, is simply the tremendous peristalsis that occurs when an animal has liquid stools and that colon is trying to squeeze out anything, trying to get a grip on anything firm. And there's nothing because in rinderpest and cases of immune disease and anything else will cause tremendous diarrhea. You just get this sort of liquidy stool and that colon just keeps doing that. And, and these are normal folds of the colon and they're, they're contracted so much and you get blood that is static in there. And the first people who described rinderpest said, ah, tiger strike me the colon but it's not a real lesion. You're going to see this. If you call this rinderpest every time uh, you see this, you're going to get laughed out of this uh, community pretty quickly. Slide number four is tissue from a foal. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis? Okay, time's up. This is a, a focally extensive suppurative carpitis. Um, and the only reason I put this in here, and I'm not going to give you even a, a, a cause because uh, I'm not sure exactly what the cause was. Probably was something like uh, a gram negative or maybe staph or something. What I want you to show, and I just want you to, sh to, to use this slide to, to uh, sort of, for those of you who don't know about this one concept, it is very simple. If you have multiple swollen joints that are, have fibrinous inflammation, you want to think about septicemia. You want to think about a condition known as joint ill, which is just infection of the navel and spread, um, although it's not always through the navel. But you want to think about septicemia. When you see this level of suppuration, th this is much more just some fibrinous exudate. You have actual necrosis that starts within the joint space that is spread into the epiphysis here. And this carpal bone actually has a fracture, pathologic fracture. It's generally the only joint space that is affected and is probably the result of trauma and bacterial infection. So when you think about, it's gonna be hot, it's gonna be painful, and we'll can't walk on it. When you think about infection, you see one joint, you want to think about trauma, bacterial, and injection 
of bacteria into it. When you see four or five joints, then you want to think of sepsis. And I was taught many, many years ago that when you go through an autopsy, you want to open seven joints, especially in some of these young animals. Okay, but there's a lot of joints. When you go into the foramen magnum to take off the head, that's a joint. You could go into multiple joints of the spine. It's easy to go into the carpi. It's easy to go into the knees. Uh, that's very quick. But always open set, whether it's the hips, anything, but open seven. You can pretty well say with confidence if you don't see any signs of inflammation, fibrin deposition in seven joints, it's not there. Okay, this was tissue from a macaw. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis, a cause? I guess that's enough. Morphologic diagnosis. Okay, time's up. We are looking at the proventriculus, the glandular stomach, and the ventriculus of this bird. Now, there's something about birds that I don't understand. Before we get into this disease, and maybe someone can explain this to me, because I think that uh, the man above, or the lady above, when she designed all these birds, she did it backwards. Um, because the function of the ventriculus or the gizzard is to grind stuff up. The function of the glandular part of the stomach or the proventriculus is to digest stuff. And I always thought it was backwards because birds eat seeds and, and all this other stuff that needs to sort of be ground and swallow and that gets in. Now, why don't they put it in the grinder to grind it before they want to digest it? It seems backwards to me. But maybe they just get it wet and sort of go through the last bath here before they grind it. I don't know how it's supposed to work. But always seem backwards. I thought they should flip this and make all of the hard stuff that the birds eat go through the grinder before they digest it. Okay, totally separate from what I want to talk about. But if anyone out there knows why it's done this way, just let me know. It's bothering me for years and years. Okay, so we are looking at the, as we said, the proventriculus and the ventriculus. The proventriculus is markedly dilated and you can see food stuff through the thin wall. Look really closely, you can sort of make out some seeds and things like that, okay? The, uh, the morphologic diagnosis. This is a viral disease which affects the normal nerve cells of the plexi which innervate the proventriculus. Morphologic diagnosis would be a multifocal to coalescing or a diffuse lymphocytic proventricular neuritis and ganglioneuritis. Okay, so when you look at this, you don't see a whole lot going on, but if you look very carefully uh, in multiple sections, you will see that there is lymphocytic inflammation within the plexi of the proventriculus. And you will see, it's tough to see, but there should be a loss of the cells. Maybe you'd be lucky enough to see lymphocytes and some of the cells that are degenerating. It's not specific just the proventriculus, but this is where the gross lesion is. You will also see it in the uh, ventriculus. You will see it in the esophagus. And you it may go all the way up the GI tract. You may see inflammation, with it, lymphocytic inflammation within the brain. So it's almost a diffuse neuritis, which primarily affects the gastrointestinal tract. And this was thought to be a number of uh, agents until about three or four or maybe five years ago when it was identified as a cytosine bornavirus. And bornaviruses are very uncommon, but they do cause lymphocytic uh, encephalitis in certain parts of Europe, in uh, horses, and there aren't a lot of them out there. We went through a bunch of different viruses thinking that's what caused this until it's been pretty well established that it is a cytosine bornavirus. The condition is called proventricular dilatation syndrome of cytosine birds, and it affects a wide range of parrots and uh, smaller cytosines as well. Okay, slide number six is tissue from a pig. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis, 
and three possible causes. Okay, time's up. Uh, what we're seeing here, this is a pretty chronic lesion, and it's a great lesion. It almost has gone to the, uh, uh, to the fibrous phase, but we're looking at a severe case of fibrinous polycerositis. We use the term polycerositis when it affects multiple serosal membranes, which would include the pleura, and would include the peritoneum. And you can see that all the, the tissues here are sort of glommed together with these large bands of fiber, and I think that some of these might have gone to uh, granulation tissue and eventually to collagen. So this animal's been sick for a long time. If we opened up this animal, you would see that you would have fibrin in all the potential spaces, which would include all those joints we talked about, and would include the meninges as well. These are all potential spaces, as is the pericardial sac. And so you see this. This is a great case of uh, polycerositis in pigs. Um, sometimes all you see are just a couple little strands of fibrin in the gut, but those are still um, polycerositis as well. Sometimes they're very disappointing. Now, there are three classic agents of uh, polycerositis in pigs. The disease is also called Glasser's disease, after Glasser, who worked with Haemophilus parasuus. Haemophilus parasuus, within the last year, has been renamed in his honor to Glasseria parasuus. And I'll never remember that. You know, you learn these 30, 40 years ago, and then you always stick with the old ones. Um, but people, my residents used to say, oh, a Glasser's disease, HMS, Smophilus parasuus, uh, mycoplasma hyorhinus, and strepsilis. Okay, and that's fine. So it reminds me of mutiny on the bounty. But however, you have to remember that, but HMS doesn't work anymore. GMS works. So that's Glasseria parasuus. Mycoplasma hyorhinus, strep suis. You know, my impression, my personal opinion of the three is that strep is the most serious one. It's one that can easily jump to people. We've had a number of outbreaks of strep suis type two from pigs and people work with pigs, humans who work with pigs, especially in Asian countries. Um, it tends to cause some of the worst lesions. It causes the most fiber and especially the worst meningitis. And sometimes it'll cause a, a separative encephalitis with very little fibrin in the meninges. Uh, Glasseria, that's a tough one too. Number well, three, mycoplasma hyorhinus is one that causes the, uh, usually the least lesions. But looking at this, you really can't tell the difference between all three. So you have to have a differential diagnosis and you might as well memorize them all. GMS, Glasseria, mycoplasma, and strepsis. Slide number six, make sure. Slide number seven. Slide number seven is tissue from a cat, or the tissue is a cat, um, but it's a kitty cat, and can you give me a likely morphologic diagnosis? Okay, this one is a very uh, a slow pitch, but uh, there was a, a nice paper written in 2014, 2015, I think, came out of Israel, which is a very sunny country, if you've never been there. And this is a white cat. And we're looking at bilateral lesions um, that are in the poorly haired area, also known as glabrous area, in front of the ears, the preauricular area. So a lot of sunlight, white cat, very little hair. It's going to give you a squamous cell carcinoma. Squamous cell carcinoma, we know that UV light has a very important factor in doing it in a multiple animal species, including people. And so when you see a white cat in this area, you gotta think about squamous cell carcinoma. And that's a nice, nice article. I don't know if it absolutely had to be written, but it did a good job with uh, UV light and white cats in Israel. So it's gonna be a tough one to get rid of. Slide number eight is tissue from a pig. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis? Okay, time's up. I think this slide is a little bit more difficult to get uh, oriented on, but we're looking at the kidney. And it looks like a rising in or near the pelvis, and we don't know exactly how this is cut. That looks like that might be pelvis as well, but there is a large multilobular mass. And I think at this point, you just need to know what are common uh, neoplasms of the kidney. 
Now it can always be lymphoma, but it doesn't look really like lymphoma. It looks like it has a little more pattern to it. And this is, believe it or not, the most common neoplasm of pigs. And I think it's largely because most of our, our literature is skewed toward very young animals. We don't see a lot of very old pigs. If you ever get, if you ever get a chance to to necropsy a 14 to 15 year old pig. They've got fantastic lesions in just about every slide. Um, but this one is a nephroblastoma. Okay, these are immature uh, cells that generally arise from uh, sort of embryonal cells, uh, most common also in chickens. Um, and then these are the ones that you get to see some very nice patterns, immature uh, cells that have multiple different patterns, uh, tubular, um, tubules with little epithelial papillary proliferation, tubules that are glomerular-like. You get to see some uh, uh, renal mesenchyme in there. So just, uh, this is a good one. You want to remember where nephroblastoma is a common tumor. Uh, it's called, in people, it's called Will's tumor. There's a Wilms tumor antigen which works very well in most species. Just remember that Wilms tumor antigen does not seem to be an absolute specific. You think, ah, oh, Wilms tumor antigen, I'm just gonna see it in this, but you can see it in a range of other tumors of the urogenital tract, including some gonadal tumors. So, but you get a positive on this one. And then PAX-8 is one that we've had good luck with in immature uh, tubules. So, two good markers, um, but a lot of these you just got diagnose histologically. Slide number nine is tissue from a dog. Can you give me morphologic diagnosis and name the condition? Okay, time's up. Believe it or not, these are metacarpal bones or metatarsal bones. Um, I can't tell you which one, but, but if you said metacarpal or metatarsal, periosteal new bone growth, I'm going to give you full credit, and that's exactly what's going on. Um, there's been a rapid growth of woven bone from the cortices, primarily starting mid-shaft, going toward the ends of the bones. And generally, you'll see this in the, uh, uh, the metacarpal bones, the phalanges, but you can see it uh, in further up. But it starts, it's most severe uh, from, the, uh, from the metacarpals and metatarsals on down, okay? and it's a diffuse proliferation affecting multiple bones. And the name of this particular condition is hypertrophic osteopathy, okay? And nobody really knows what causes this. Back in the day, it was thought that if you had a mass lesion in your chest, it was first associated with big masses in the chest. And it was thought, okay, that's what causes it, but that doesn't make hardly any sense. And some people said, well, you got a big mass in your chest, and you are gonna irritate the vagal nerve. The vagal nerve is gonna cause um, dilation of arterioles at the periosteum, and you'll have this periosteal new bone growth. Okay, and then some people went back and they cut the vagus nerve in these animals, if they could find one, and the lesion regressed a bit. And so that one, that theory has, has been propagated. Uh, but then it turns out that you can see them not only with mass lesions, in the chest, but also mass lesions in the abdomen as well, identified uh, uh, in accordance with dysgerminomas in uh, horses. It's been seen in urinary bladder tumors in dogs. So that, and then, then more people said, well, it's not just in mass lesions because animals with diffuse mycotic infections in the lungs will get it. So nobody really knows what it is. Do some of these masses are, are there uh, do they liberate substances which cause uh, hypertension at the periosteum in these very selective areas? So I don't think anybody really knows what this is. Hypertrophic osteopathy. And finally, let's move on to slide number 10. And this is tissue from an ox. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis, a cause, name the disease, and give me four other affected organs. Well, that's a lot to ask. Okay, well, this is an old picture. We are looking at uh, a bisected cerebrum, and you can see, why would they put it this way? Facing apart, that's sort of an odd thing. But, okay, so we have 
multifocal to coalescing, sort of randomly distributed areas of hemorrhage and most importantly, necrosis in the cerebrum. This is a condition that used to be seen a lot more than it is now because the sort of the way this disease happens has changed. Um, this would be a feedlot steer probably with a necrohemorrhagic random encephalitis. And the name of the condition back then was thromboembolic meningoencephalitis. But it turns out that uh, th these really aren't emboli, they form uh, in the brain. So now it's been reduced to thrombotic meningoencephalitis. TEME was cool, TME not as cool. Um, but what you're looking at are areas of vascular thrombosis. And this is a great agent because when you cut those in and you put a stain on it, you can often see bacterial colonies there in the, uh, in the thrombi. It's not just, uh, it turns out it is not just histophilus somni, the cause of agent, but they're orchestrating a biofilm. Um, and they're the brains behind this big biofilm and it attaches to the epithelial cells and damages that and results in thrombosis. Now, this used to be um, the most common form of this disease in feedlots, but it's changed over the years. And nowadays we see a lot of more pneumonia. And I said it's not the somni was one of the agents that can cause a shipping fever like um, condition, especially when it's mixed with other forms of the bovine respiratory syndrome, which you would see for the first time some of these naive steers coming into the feedlots. So, uh, so lung would be another agent. Uh, it classically will affect the heart as well and often will cause abscesses in the areas of the papil papillary muscles, the hardest working spot in your heart. That's a great clue that you're dealing with estophilus somni. Um, it can also cause uterine infections and finally it will cause disease of the joints or polyarthritis. So those are your four other agents, estophilus somni and thrombotic meningoencephalitis. Well, that brings us to the end of today's lecture. I hope you enjoyed it uh, being Thursday. Tomorrow, uh, hopefully come back and you have already registered. I'm hoping for Dr. Matty Pupil's lecture, which will be uh, delivered live um, via Zoom at uh, 12 p.m. There are still seats available. And go on our Facebook page if you want to register for that. After that, we will in the afternoon, make that available for people who were not there live or be, for people in other time zones. So tomorrow you'll have a new lecture on the prognostic factors associated with the diagnosis of canine mast cell tumors um, by Dr. Matty Kupel. And I'll be back on Saturday and Sunday with another Gross Path Challenge. Y'all have a fantastic day. Be safe. Let's beat this thing.